The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the GALA webinar series. My name is Manuela Noske, and I'm the Communications Manager at GALA. GALA is a global nonprofit trade association that enables communication and business across languages and cultures. We're headquartered in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. And today we will hear from Hartmut van Berg and Maren betjem Baye from LogMeIn about how they evolved the localization team at LogMeIn from a translation service provider to a globalization consultant. But before we get to our topic, I need to go over our housekeeping items. Everyone's lines are muted to cut down on any noise. If you experience any technical difficulties, let me know by using your chat box and I will work with you to troubleshoot them. If you have a slow internet connection, your audio may be disrupted. If that happens, you can use the number listed on the GoToWebinar panel to call in using your phone. We are making a recording of this presentation and you will be able to find it following the presentation on GALA's global website. All participants will receive a link. If you have any questions or comments, please type them into your chat box and we will try to get as many of your questions as we can with the time remaining after the presentation. Next, let me introduce our speakers. Hartmut von Berg is head of localization at LogMeIn, which is the maker of industry-leading solutions for unified communications like GoToMeeting and GoToConnect, GoToWebinar, which we're using today, customer engagement and support like Bolt360, as well as identity and access like LastPass. He also serves as the site leader for the LogMeIn Karlsruhe office in Germany, driving employee satisfaction, employer branding, and Lock Me In's Mission Possible charity and youth education programs. Before dedicating his heart fully to Lock Me In's international customer base, Hartmut served as an engineering leader for Lock Me In's go to product suite. Maren Betjem Waye has been working in the localization industry since 2008. At present, she thrives in her role as localization project manager for Lock Me In. She manages process-oriented projects, as well as transcreation and localization of all sorts of business-related content. And she is instrumental in figuring out workplace practices in organizational development in terms of promoting a global-first mindset. In her spare time, she enjoys studying INO psychology at FOM University in Essen, Germany, and connecting with family and friends around the globe. Her biggest and yet to be mastered challenge is to learn the wall of language in Senegal. And that makes Marian a personal hero of mine. And without any further ado, Hartmut and Marin, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hartmut von Berg, head of localization at LogMeIn. And I'm Maren Bietjen Bay, localization project manager at LogMeIn. And we would like to welcome you on our fantastic journey from translation service provider to globalization consultant. And invite you to help us unfold our wings and learn to fly. Before we start with our journey, uh, we would like to quickly introduce the localization maturity model from Common Sense Advisory, which most of you are probably familiar with. But in case not, we would like to make sure everybody is with us when we talk about our involvement during today's webinar. And with that, I will switch off my webcam to avoid further distraction. Many organizations will pass the same milestones on their way to localizing their products and related communication assets. Communication Sense Advisory, a common sense advisory, decided to document the organizational process and technology landmarks of localization so that companies which are new to the process can benefit from the experiences of those companies that preceded them on this path. And you can see the path here on the slide. So from many discussions and interviews, Common Sense Advisory extracted the critical milestones which they have named the localization maturity model. Common Sense Advisory, CSA in short, 
found that most organizations pass through four stages of maturity before reaching the ideal process. And companies will proceed through these maturity levels at different speeds. Often they're more advanced in one aspect than in others. So for example, an organization could be at level three looking at localization specific technology deployment, but only at level two in terms of end-to-end -end processes with stakeholders. So how did the localization story at LogMeIn begin? Let me quickly share some background information on how localization evolved in the past three years. Once upon a time in late 2015, a global player prepared for a big change. Citrix Systems had decided to spin off their online collaboration business, that's us, the go-to product suite, and the spun-off entity had to ramp up all the formally centralized functions needed to support the new company to be, and one of these functions was localization. The Citrix globalization team was a very well-oiled machine between the maturity levels managed and optimized, and after spinning out of it, we dropped far behind again, losing a lot of our technical resources and support, which placed us somewhere between the maturity levels reactive and repeatable again. This is when I, as an engineering leader, got involved in building that localization function to ensure business continuity by providing a localized customer experience to our international customer base. By mid-year, we ramped up the team consisting of two experienced localization project managers one of which is with me in this webinar today, and a localization engineer. Just enough to get the ball rolling and to slowly get back to the, uh, the repeatable maturity level milestone. Later that year, there was a pivotal change towards merging the Citrix spin-off with a key competitor named LogMeIn. The merger formed a top 10 SaaS company in early 2017. Let's pause here to recap where we started over in early 2017. On day two, after the merger in February 2017, we had two small teams with experienced localization project managers and localization engineers, historically aligned to different departments. One was product engineering and the other one technical writing. Those two teams were led by two leaders with only partial focus on localization. Both teams had many similarities in how they operated to provide ad hoc translation services to their internal stakeholders, but used different tools and different external vendors. And again, with all the restructuring going on in the entire company, people leaving or shuffling into new positions, you can imagine that the two teams fell back again to a rather reactive state, talking in maturity levels. Now, the question that imposed itself automatically was, what would be the next steps to take? And there were some tough decisions to be made. Should we follow the standard path of a merger? Meaning merging, merging the function and consolidating tools, vendors, processes, and leadership, but keeping the mission of being a centralized and well-functioning translation service provider? Or was it this one of those unique windows of opportunity to be limitless, fearless stepping out of the comfort zone, to challenge the status quo, and to forge the path none have traveled before, revolutionizing the way localization operates at LogMeIn, and repositioning it, repositioning it according to the value it could bring to the table to fuel international growth? We decided for the revolution. You might ask why I put the R of revolution in brackets. Well, here's the answer. Every revolution needs some time to prepare, and we still had some homework to do in the middle of change happening around us. All our internal customers were facing organizational change due to the merger. So we decided to stabilize our function first and focus on enabling the team and the function to take the big next step while keeping production up and consolidating workflows and tools. Looking forward, it was 
quite obvious that we needed to switch from reactive to active and own the future of localization at Logmian. Looking at the window of opportunity that had just opened, we were all sure we needed to do three things. First, find the right place for the localization function within Logmian. Second, find executive sponsorship for this idea of finding the right place. And third, convince the future owner of localization that his organization and the company will benefit from the change. Hey, that sounds easy, doesn't it? Finding the right place. What would be the best option? If our aspiration is more than just improving what we currently do, which was getting content translated, would we be able to fuel international growth? Where is localization rooted in the industry? It's hard to find a real pattern, but you can get some inspiration. And then we started to dream. To fuel international growth, localization needs to be transformed away from pro providing translation services towards influencing business decisions, decisions about investments into markets, decisions about how LMI operates with international markets in mind. That's it. It felt like a wake-up wake up call. One thought was that we need to be customer-centric. We need to get close to where decisions of international markets are made. At Lock Me In, this was the international organization headquartered in Dublin. But how is the international leader aware of the potential and value a matured localization function could add? A few key things helped us. One being an international leader does not need to be convinced to think global first. And we had created a framework to assess market readiness a while ago for one specific product. And that's the immediate value we could bring to the table and build on it. Plus, we could demonstrate that we had formed a highly motivated team willing to bring localization to the next level. And that was set up for success. Now, all we had to do was find a leader for the localization function and the right level in the international organization. Seeing the potential of a transformed localization function and being a passionate organization developer myself, it was an easy decision for me to drop my engineering responsibilities and fully dedicate my energy to transform a translation service into a globalization consultancy. Woohoo! Mid-28, we finally officially unified the two localization functions and moved it under the umbrella of LMI's international organization. A new era could begin. Now, how do we transform our localization function? We aligned with our most important stakeholder and created clarity and transparency on priorities. First of all, we redefined our vision and defined the key elements of our three-year strategy. Globalization as the change catalyst to fuel the international growth engine. That's the new north. Then we defined three strategic pillars that would drive our priorities. First, optimal core services. With a strong focus on process to deliver international products and content at the speed of SaaS. Second, customer centricity to provide competitive differentiation and relevance in international markets. That's our purpose. We, global first mindset, to unlock and leverage the potential of the entire workflow force. This one targets organizational development. Early 2019, we added the fourth pillar to our strategy, large projects, to deliver transformative localization projects linked to LogMain's growth strategy, all about navigating operational priorities. Furthermore, we asked for help. To define the next best steps on our journey, we conducted the localization maturity assessment against the localization maturity model 3.0 together with CSA research. This helped us understand our status quo and what should be prioritized mid and long term. Then we focused on removing the main road blockers. 
For the short-term priorities, we identified the key operational pain points to be resolved to further improve our scalability and to enable us to continue our transformational work. So what do we do? We defined and implemented highly automated end-to-end -end localization processes in partnership with our key stakeholders, and we centralized localization budget management. Let me recap the challenges we face and share how we address them. We faced a production increase of 156% year over year in 2019. While we stayed flat on headcount, so how did we manage? We developed the team into T-shaped experts and automated wherever possible. For our many strategic and important topics that need to be addressed to help us with our transformational work, we strictly prioritize and leverage external help where appropriate. Since it's complex and takes time to change mindsets, we learn to be patient with ourselves and our internal customers as we are expecting change in behavior. Sounds familiar and a bit like a standard recipe? Let's see what other factors help us to be successful. While moving forward, we realized that some things work at the pace expected, some not, and some seem to be stuck. We analyzed our success factors and found that we can break down silos and get stakeholders committed to work together on an improved end-to-end -end localization workflow and even get them motivated to change the way they are thinking and working today, whenever we do the following. We understand the business and rationale of our customers. We understand their current pain points with localization. We understand the pain points we would create by introducing a new workflow or new tools. We identify the benefits they and the company would have after implementing the new workflow or tool. We implement solutions in an agile way in tight collaboration across functions. And we take each and every opportunity to evangelize a global first mindset and find ambassadors in all stakeholder groups at all levels. In summary, we embrace our customers and establish sustainable partnerships, taking their needs into account. We're doing the same with our vendors. So what have we achieved? We are now more and more involved in the planning of critical market or global product launches at an early stage. And we're gaining reputation as globalization consultants and are seen as a critical function that can help with successful planning and execution. So what lies ahead of us? Let's provide some examples of our current focus areas and where you can help us fly. SEO localization, a very interesting field where we haven't seen patterns how to solve it in the industry so far. We strive to define and implement a scalable SEO localization workflow that goes hand in hand with content localization. The second topic will be about quality left shifting. Here we first want and need to comprehend where we currently stand and then implement a build, measure, learn loop to allow continuous monitoring of the quality we deliver. At the same time, we're looking in we're looking to implement strong terminology management to deliver a global customer experience that is consistent in terminology. Our current focus is on product and user experience and content creation of support content. The third topic is neural machine translation, where we strive to leverage NMT to improve scalability, address unaided markets and reduce costs. Let's have a closer look at the SEO localization challenge. If you want to drive more potential customers to your marketing web pages, you need to make them discoverable. Typing in a domain specific phrase into their preferred search engine, Google, Bing, etc., you name it, your potential customers should see your content ranked number one on the first page of the search results and not at page 5, 10, or 100. The same applies to your international markets as well. 
let's focus on content created in your source language for a moment. If you have a knowledgeable in-house SEO team like we do, you're in a great position. They know what needs to be done to optimize content to show up in the desired place on search results. If you don't, you can work with an SEO, SEO agency helping you achieving your desired results. Both will research which phrases are used most by your customers to find relevant information in the domain you're looking for. Then they will apply their magic and modify the content to incorporate those terms and phrases. Et voila, your web pages appear with a better rank in search results, thus increasing your traffic and hopefully the conversion rates as well. So far, so good. Job done. Doesn't look like a big challenge. There seems to be a repeatable and manageable process. Let's apply this process to our international web pages and see if it works. First, we localize the source content that you see on the left into a target language. Let's use German. Then, we research the relevant phrases in target language for SEO and apply the SEO phrases to localized content. Looks simple, right? Now let's test if the process is repeatable. You now have source content, which has been translated into and, the optimi and optimized for the target language. What to do if your source content has changes? For example, because a changed or added feature. You have to localize the source content into your target language again. And this will now overwrite the optimization to the target content you applied before, and you have to redo the optimization step. Doesn't really work like expected. And there is another uh, use case that I would like to show you. And this time, your source content gets updated with optimization because the terms and phrases users are looking for have changed. This change again will trigger a localization request, which translates the source content into your target languages. This will now overwrite the optimization to the target content you applied before, and you have to redo the optimization step. Also, this one is not working like expected. And there is another challenge you need to be aware of. You do not want to mess up your, uh, your translation memories with the SEO terms and phrases as they change over time and do not necessarily align 100% with your terminology. So, how to create a repeatable and manageable translation and optimization process then? The topic seems to be hot, as it has been picked up and became part of a panel discussion with leading industry experts right after a talk I gave at SlaterCon in Amsterdam last November. None of them had a really compelling solution to it, though they all do international SEO. We've talked to many LSPs, technology vendors, industry experts, and research agencies since then, and I want to share the two options we currently see to re resolve the issue. Solution number one, that's the one that you see on the screen, is a multi-vendor strategy. You need to work with specialized vendors, LSPs for content translation, and international or local SEO agencies to optimize the target content. And you need to have two separate steps in your workflow, translation and optimization. Then you need to set up your content in a, in a way that you can identify and distinguish the paragraphs that contain optimized content and build monolingual uh, translation memories that contain translated content and optimized content in target language. This way, 
you can reapply the optimization if retranslation of the source content overrides the optimization of the target. This solution has a lot of technical challenges to be solved and you need to find SEO agencies able to work with your localization toolset, terminology and translation management systems. This solution provides higher flexibility for vendor selection and keeps you in control for process automation. The second solution that we see is a single vendor strategy. Work with one vendor who has resources with translation, transcreation and SEO knowledge and is capable of applying both translation and optimization in one step. This solution has higher requirements to your vendor portfolio and creates a higher dependency to your vendor, but it's easier to implement. You might ask, what are we doing? So we are currently exploring both options, as both have their advantages and disadvantages, and we strive to find the best fit for our specific situation. But now let's move on to look at quality. Thanks, Hartmut. On our journey from repeatable to managed, quality management is one of the topics that we pushed out a little, and you may be surprised to hear that, but we have not felt any pressure so far as we receive fairly little negative feedback, and being German, at least Hartmut and I, we like to think that feedback is good feedback. So um, we don't really know how we're actually doing. We know that we should care and find out. At the same time, we want to do this based on informed decisions and reasonable investment and efforts. We are aiming at left shifting quality management, meaning left on a time scale, so early, early in the process, and this way avoid issues that rather than fixing them at the end where issues then may have multiplied across languages and assets, documents, websites, and so forth. Fixing issues when they are discovered instead of where they originate can easily multiply costs by 10 or more, depending on how much further down the process chain they're discovered. So what are we up to? First, we need to understand if we actually have a problem, quality problem. And as a next step, we need to open the feedback channel to get that information, analyze and assess it and learn from it to see what kind of issues we are dealing with and where they originate. If we take the UI, the user interface process as an example, questions that may come up are, do we need to enhance internationalization with engineering? Or do we need to improve provisioning of context with our user experience and product management teams? Do our translators need more product training? Do our translation info kit or does our translation info kit that we provide upfront to our vendors lack important information? Then once we identified the root cause of the issue and its location in the process and sphere of ownership, take measures to avoid the issue from presenting itself in the future. One area that we identified very early during our journey is terminology management. It is kind of a platitude that well-managed terminology improves understandability and thus fosters satisfaction with the customers. Usability uh, brings down costs, especially translation costs, and speeds up turnaround time of translations and eventually time to market. And yet terminology management tends to remain neglected. Everyone seems to be in agreement that it should be done, but it's always at risk to get deprioritized in favor of production or other more important short-term projects if you don't have a person fully dedicated to the topic. We experienced the same thing, so thanks to some good recommendations from leading terminology experts in our industry that I had the pleasure of meeting, we got the advice to hire some knowledgeable students who specialized in terminology during their studies of translation or technical documentation, communication and media management, and who are really passionate about terminology. The first student, who by the way, is now a full-time localization project manager in our team, wrote her master's thesis with us, analyzed our status quo, 
came up with recommendations for a process and a tool and provided a very solid basis for a business case. Under her guidance, the following student took on the actual terminology work, defined workflows, set up the tool and filled the term base, and now keeps on evangelizing the initiative with content creators and stakeholders. Because what we ultimately would like to achieve is a buy-in and commitment to implement corporate terminology management, meaning orchestrating and coordinating terminology creation and management for the entire company, not just for, for the localization team. If we had to assess our maturity of terminology management for our localization team, we would say that we're now somewhere between reactive and repeatable, whereas the company is still on the unmanaged level. See, this is what usually happens. Localization feels the pain of unmanaged terminology, unmanaged at the source, with all the translators' queries coming in and realizing that the terminology of the source content is very inconsistent and nonetheless try to create good target content from that, which is very painful and expensive. And we as a function cannot fix the root cause, which relates back to lack of ownership within the company. But what we can do is develop this idea up to a certain degree of maturity in terms of process, proof of, proof of concept, um, in, in order to showcase the benefits and get buy-in from the ones who should drive and own the topic. So this is the crossroads that we are working towards at the moment. Become an expert, a trusted advisor or consultant and find and convince a sponsor, the Global First Mindset, who will help drive terminology management on the corporate level. To sum it up, the quality topic in terms of quality left shift, Terminology management is one of our first endeavors in the realm of proactive quality management. Establishing a quality feedback loop is the second. And depending on our findings in the feedback we receive, there will for sure be more areas to tackle in the future. With this, I hand back to Hartmut to cover machine translation. Thank you, Mara. So we're seeking to answer the next big questions how to handle increasing volume. You remember our workload raised by 156% in 2019 and increasing frequency of market launches, be it new product features to be released to existing markets or whole products entering a new market. How can we deliver faster while keeping our high quality standards and at the same time being more cost efficient? We heard some whispers machine translation, machine translation, neural machine translation. Well, neural machine translation is the leading technology for automated translation. Industry adoption rate rapidly grows as it demonstrates its potential for significant cost savings while delivering output closer to human translation than any technology before. But how to approach it? Let's investigate and define and implement an NMT strategy to reduce cost of localization and decrease time to market. Here's our recipe. First, you need to build some knowledge. Just deep enough to understand the technology, its benefits and caveats, to allow you to digest and verify the many recommendations you get from technology vendors and LSPs and to be able to ask the right questions and get them answered. Fortunately, we have a team member who is very passionate about NMT and AI and who had built already the basic knowledge to get this started. So it was only a question of prioritizing NMT and deepened the knowledge. Now, what's the next step? Define your objective. You need to answer questions like, is your focus on cost efficiency? Or do you need to handle increasing volume? Or do you strive to reduce turnaround times? This type of questions need to be answered at a very early point of your journey to allow focus and to stay realistic with your approach. Let's define a SMART goal. Remember, specific, 
measurable, actionable, realistic and time bound. I personally like this approach as it helps in many ways to focus on the right things at the right time. We decided to start with a focus on efficiency for cost and time. That's the first component of our SMART goal. Hmm. Guess we need to add something to not jeopardize our quality. Let's add while producing same output quality as human translation. Now, how do we produce the same output quality as human translation would do? We know that NMT produces great results, getting closer and closer to human translation, but it's still not there and might never be. Let's add a post-editing step. I think we need to apply a bit more focus as well. Can we apply this goal to all the content we localize? Which content type which would produce the best results? Where do we have significant volume so absolute cost reduction would be higher than necessary investments? We answered this set of questions with support content. As it has high volume and is growing fast due to, due to the high frequency of our product and feature releases, you might have different answers. Another focus question would be, do you aim to support your long tail or unaided markets with machine translation? Or would it be better to test NMT in your existing markets? The latter would allow us to better understand the impact to our customer base. So we decided to focus on our core language set. We are still missing something, aren't we? Yes, we need to make it realistic and time bound. We want to implement NMT support by end of 2020. Connecting all the ingredients and being even more specific defines our goal for 2020. Now we need a strategy to achieve the objective. There are many ways to move forward, from outsourcing to doing everything in-house, from agile to waterfall project management. We prefer a lean and agile approach where we can quickly iterate and course correct based on learnings while we go. And as we have an established set of LSPs and well-working localization tool chain, we aimed to add NMT technology to our current tool chain and leverage our existing LSPs for post-editing. This leads to a couple of hypotheses we need to verify. The first hypothesis is NMT produces good enough quality. In the last quarter of the last year, we selected an NMT engine and a language pair, trained it with our available TMs, and worked with one of our LSPs to assess the NMP, NMT output regarding accuracy and fluency. Results were good enough to move forward. The next hypothesis that we tested, the selected NMT engine can be integrated with our localization process, leveraging our existing tool chain. We successfully work with our LSP and with our TMS provider to ensure a smooth integration. That's where we are at the moment. Ready to test the next hypothesis. Our LSPs have the right resources to do high quality post editing. And the second uh, hypothesis, NMT plus post editing provides significant cost reduction. We are testing these two hypotheses together in Q2 and plan to roll out more languages in the second half of the year. 50 hypotheses have been validated. Thank you for joining us on our journey from translation service provider to globalization consultant.
If you would like to get more information, discuss our approach or an idea that can help us progress, we are happy to receive your feedback and answer you any question you may have. All right, thank you Hartmut, thank you Maren uh, for, for your insight and for sharing what you've learned on your journey, which is indeed quite impressive. Uh, let's start with this question here. How do you actually convince internal stakeholders to collaborate on process improvements? Process is typically a stepchild in many, many companies. Nobody wants to look at it. How do you get a people together to actually, you know, look into it and invest in that particular space? The experience that we made in, in this regard is um, we need to find a way to show the benefit that the specific stakeholders would have with the approach. So initially, usually if you're focused on yourself, you look at your own benefits that, that you need to apply or that you that you want to, to get out of a, a change that you're initiating. And this doesn't really resonate well with uh, your stakeholders. So you need to understand what they uh, what their concerns are, what, what their goals are, and then you need to find a way to transform uh, your goals into theirs to show the benefit, and then usually you get easily buy-in. That's mm -hmm. a little prep work you need to take, but it's worth the effort. Very, very true, isn't it, for just about all of the changes that you're trying to implement, right? You need to convince their stakeholders of the value that it has for them, absolutely. Um, and then let's ask one other general question here. Um, how did you succeed uh, convincing the business to move localization to a different place in the org? I mean, how challenging was that? And, and again, how did you manage to um, to convince them that that was the right move? Uh, the, I try to give the short story. <laughs> <laughs> The very short story uh, uh, we've seen in, in the in the webinar um, on our journey, but uh, especially this process took a while because we had to we had these two different uh, localization organi uh, organizations that were on the way to to be merged, and they were um, organized in in different structures uh, in in the company. And so it, it was a, a necessity at, at this point, and it was um, very well understood that it would make sense to unify this team. And then the back and forth began. Should be who of the two leaders um, should take the whole team, or is it the right place? Uh, and the good thing was, both leaders, me and, and the other uh, leader, who had the, the other half of the uh, Formal localization team, we were very quickly in agreement that we need to find the right place. And then we started to, to think about the options. We observed the company, the, how the, the new structure coming out of the merger evolved. And we started to talk to different people uh, to test borders and to figure out how they think. So that, that's a long process. It took us uh, behind the scenes roughly half a year um until we were uh, until we were convinced which would be the best the very best option and uh, once we found that the window of, uh, of opportunity was just there and we could mm -hmm. grab the opportunity but it's one of one of my mottos be always prepared we prepared mm -hmm. a lot behind of the scenes and when the window of opportunity came yeah. by we were able to jump on it yeah opportunity meeting preparedness right very good um, what are, or can you describe what uh, some of your biggest challenges were in making the transition that you made? Uh, one of the biggest challenge uh, was definitely finding the right place. Uh, once that was done, um, Yeah, the, the production increase that we saw was a big challenge because we were usually we would have not been set up to to cope with that production increase with the same uh, amount um, of people. Um, but also here it's it's a kind of 
preparedness game. So we took the time to prepare uh, for it and developed ourselves um, virtually unified the team before we did the big step, uh, started to automate process, consolidate tools and, and so forth. And that helped uh, a lot in, in facing that challenge. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we have a question about your uh, your quality feedback loops. Uh, you know, could you just talk about what you learned while establishing those? We are in the middle of establishing it, so we are learning, or we will be learning the next week. So we started with um, creating a very simple form. Um, um, we're using JIRA as an internal tool, so the entire company has access to JIRA. And what we're currently looking for is internal feedback. So not necessarily the feedback coming from the outside, that's a second step, but we would take the feedback that our internal customers can give us. Many of them have exposure to customers, so this way there would be an indirect loop back to us. Um, but we're hoping that this very simple form uh, will give us better insights um, of what kind of issues we're dealing with um, and that we're not aware of. And mm -hmm. that's going to happen in the next weeks. Well, we'll be excited to hear about it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other quality topics uh, that you see that, that need addressing in the future? What's your thinking there, forward-looking? For quality left shifting, um, we currently assume kind of that it may be internationalization. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to get some more expertise here, uh, also through students, that could be one opportunity. Um, maybe we also need help from outside, and I think that's the key thing here, you always need to ask for help. Um, you can't expect to have all the expertise in your team or in your company. Um, other areas, um, content creation. Um, currently, we're very focused on, on the US market. And not all of the content is translatable or localizable. Uh, we would need a second editing step to make it fit to international markets. And, and that's something else that requires, above all, probably education. But those are, I think, the two areas that could come up. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions around NMT, but before we get there, here's a question around your, your new business model, the changes that you made. Are you seeing a decrease on the use of translators uh, because you're relying more on technology? And, and do you even know? I mean, I don't know who you work with. Or are you relying on translators in the same way and, and, and the same manner as you have before? I would think it's increasing. Mm -hmm. um, but increasing because of more volume or? Well, we have more volume mm -hmm. and at the same time, um, yeah, we need more people as, mm -hmm. as what we can see or what we learn from a, a vendor that we work with very closely and they are very transparent about their own um, development is that they have to ramp up on onboard new translators continuously um, to meet the demands that we confront them with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's another component with it as well. So localization is not a, a, a constant uh, flow. Yeah. So the, the, the work comes in um, sometimes with uh, high demand peak projects, uh, three, four, five simultaneously, because there are three product lines launching, uh, having a big launch in uh, at the end of Q2. Yeah. And so our vendors need to be able to, to scale up very fast. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the next quarter, we have way less um, work to do. So that's, Another challenge. Yeah. Thanks. 
Um, so let's turn to NMT now. Uh, how many NMT technology vendors have you evaluated? And then we have a second question here that you may not want to answer. You always want to be careful uh, yeah, around not endorsing any particular vendor or system or engine, but can you share what NMT engine or system you are actually using? You know, again, if, if you can refrain from mentioning a name, it would be good, but <laughs> give us some understanding. I'm, I'm asking you to do the impossible here. <laughs> so let's start with how many technology vendors have you actually evaluated? What did you learn? And, and were you able yeah. to make a decision or are you using two or three? Yeah, so um, let me uh, phrase it that way. The first idea was um, to have an evaluation step where we evaluate a couple of uh, technology vendors, a couple of different engines, uh, figuring out um, which engine supports which language pair, uh, pairs best possible and so forth. But after our first evaluation step, and there we selected an engine for a couple of reasons and that was um, it we wanted to to integrate it into our process so we could do this on a kind of paper base uh, uh, to, to just do uh, select an en uh, a short list of engines that were promising for that and then we took a lot of research data and talked to a lot of uh, people uh, what their current thinking is and then we came up with the first engine that we started to evaluate or, or, or test out our um, evaluation model. And the results with this engine were so good yeah. that we pivoted already and said, okay, we can now evaluate five others, but we don't expect the results to be that different. Mm -hmm. So let's not do that point in time. But let's do the next one, the next important, let's test the next hypothesis, which is, okay, if we put production traffic uh, on this, um, do we see the expected results in terms of cost efficiency? Because it doesn't make sense if we evaluate, uh, uh, do a big evaluation, and then after uh, half a year of testing and evaluating, we figure out uh, the cost efficiency is not there. Right. Yeah, so we, we are really we, we are really taking a lean approach here, testing a, a hypothesis. If it's good enough, move on to the next one. This evaluation step, the bigger evaluation step, uh, still lies ahead of us, um, but depends on on the results that we see um, at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you or measure? EG, I mean, yeah, and so how do you measure the cost efficiency with NMT? Yeah, so while we are only routing a couple of languages uh, in the beginning through this process and uh, having the rest of the languages for the same content purely with human translation, you can uh, very easily get um, a picture of how the post-editing cost plus the investment into the, the engine um, competes with pure human um, mm -hmm. uh, translation. translation. Okay. All right. Um, I think those are all the questions that we had. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and walking us through your experience. It was really interesting. Thanks for doing that. And a big thank you to our Welcome. audience uh, for joining us today uh, and for asking uh, your questions. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you could take just a minute to give us your feedback on today's session using the post-event survey. It is short but it really helps us to continue to refine our webinar program. <clears throat> and with that, <clears throat> I wish you all a good day or a good night, uh, depending on where you are. I hope you will all stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you at another gala webinar soon. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.